Oh, I don't think I can hear you. Now oh. you can. Yay! Oh, there. <laughs> it's Chuck. It's Chuck. Chuck. Chuck should host the show. I'm tired. <laughs> oh, he totally could. Hi, Hello, Chuck. everyone. <laughs> Hello. The Chuck Hello. Squirrel Show. Welcome to this week's learning space <laughs> with Captain Chuck. Um, yes, I apparently, am Captain Chuck. I officially got the story of, of Chuck. So Chuck is actually a uh, My Moon mascot. So that's a, a JPL uh, outreach project about lunar science. Uh, and, and it's actually one of the guys who works there, who you and I both know, who has a Chuck costume. Yeah, I was going to say. It's, it's much actually, larger than our Chuck, right? Yes, but it, it actually started yeah, as... Sure. Whoever was developing the website just happened to put a squirrel as an icon. They thought it was funny, and they kind of ran away with it. So, yeah, and uh, that's why we have our own little Captain Chuck um, to in solidarity with the My Moon people. Uh, but also, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is Learning Space. I'm a little bit rambly today. I'm Nicole Gallucci. I am postdoc with Cosmo okay. Fest. Uh, we are in the throes of prepping for our 24-hour Hangout-a-thon that is happening this weekend, starting at 11 a.m. Central. Uh, and uh, with me is Georgia Bracey. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so Georgia Bracey is in charge of CosmoQuest Education. Um, and uh, I have Chuck here with me today because he and I were in Indianapolis last week, uh, and we were at the American Astronomical Society meeting. Uh, it was uh, one of the smaller meetings. Usually the spring meetings are a bit smaller, um, but um, it, was a, it was a you know fairly short drive for us. In fact, I have a picture of Chuck. Oh, I don't have it open. Uh, Is he I, driving? I, well, no, I, I, but I, I have not He's old enough. I, I, you know, I have trouble seeing over the steering wheel. <laughs> He's far shorter than I am. Uh, um, put a cushion but, under him. He'll be I, just fine. Just get a few. Do they even make phone books anymore? I, <laughs> you know, I think, unfortunately, they do. I think they still do. But, they still do. Just yeah. a lot of phone books. Uh, no, I we uh, drove the three hours to, uh, let me see if I can screen share this, to road Indianapolis trip. for a little road trip. So oh, this is actually uh, Captain Chuck. And, wait, and who uh, else? And uh, <laughs> this is plushy Will Wheaton. <laughs> <laughs> they were strapped into the passenger seat of my car. I'm uh, sure they got along just fine together. They did. They really did. They're, they're good traveling buddies. Kind of bonded, um, yeah. <laughs> So we went, we went to uh, AAS222, if you're, if you're looking at all these hashtags and wondering what the heck that was about. That was uh, coming from that conference. A uh, whole bunch of science news stories that I'm sure you've been keeping up on. Lots of Kepler news. Um, lots of news coming out of uh, ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the education results um, and uh, uh, ideas and presentations and things that were talked about at the meeting. Um, I want to remind you guys watching, uh, first of all, if you can share this, that would be great. I didn't, uh, I failed to invite all the people I usually invite, so if you can share that link out, uh, that would be cool. And uh, you can comment, comment along with yeah. us as well. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can comment there. If you're watching on Google+, Plus on the event page, we're picking those up. Um, and anywhere else on Google+, Plus, this is posted, I should have captured as well. If you use the hashtag learning space on Twitter, we are following that too. Um, so maybe we all should just things. all of the things. All yes. those places. <laughs> so maybe we should just uh, jump right into it. Um, hey, you didn't see a life size Will Wheaton walking around. Wish that would be awesome. No, I did not. Sadly, okay. I have seen a life size okay. Will Wheaton walking around Dragon <laughs> Con though. But sadly, not. That would at, be the place. Yeah. Not at a double yeah. AS meeting. So. Well, maybe it may be in the future. Nor was there a large squirrel, just the little guy. <laughs> okay. Aww. Yeah. Um. So, uh, there was a bunch of actually there was a the the uh, one of the big education sec uh, here we go sessions was on Monday, so the first day of the conference, and it was called Astronomy Education: Where Are We Now and Where Are We Going. Um, and so there were a series of 15-minute talks, which is much longer than the usual five minutes that people get at a AAS meeting, which was uh, kind of nice, actually, to uh, give people a little bit more time to flesh out their ideas. Um, and uh, so first there was a talk by Ed Prather of uh, the Center for Astronomy Education. Uh, I've taken one of their workshops before, before I was actually um, teaching astronomy in college, and so that 
that uh, help me out quite a bit. Uh, it's especially useful if you're teaching large lectures. They give you some really great ideas yeah. on yeah. how to um, get participation from your students even when you're teaching yeah. in like a theater. <laughs> yep, make it more interactive. Yeah, yeah. And student centered, yes, even in the huge group. Yeah. Um, and this, uh, and since the question was where are we and where are we going from here, that group in particular has done a lot of um, research into how you can change the Astronomy 101 classroom because for a lot of people, and this may be true for some of you guys watching, that, that was the last formal science education that a lot of people get. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to college, you got to take one or two science courses if you're not a science major, and people tend towards astronomy because it's mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> Um, and so we, uh, so so that is a way for for us as educators to do public outreach on a broad scale before these people go on to become politicians or lawyers or you know something not sciencey but something uh, making somewhere else in decisions about how things are run and what happens in your world. So it's actually kind of, it's kind of a scary thing when you think about it, and it makes you realize how important those intro and general courses are because it's it's all the citizens out there you know it may be their only chance to not only see some of the new content and discoveries in science but kind of get a, flick, a feel for how it works so if you're letting them in on you know the processes of science how science is done um, that could be the only time they see that so it's really important yeah yeah uh, one of the one of the issues in particular he talked about um, as far as where can we go from this um, is, is uh, tying science and society and tying attitudes about science uh, mm -hmm. into that educational research as well. Seeing how science is important to real world problems, right? So astronomy may generally deal with things that are big and far away, um, but like you said, the concepts and practices that you learn in that class are mm -hmm. going to extend to your thinking of things like global climate change or um, even economic difficulties that we're having. Mm -hmm. It's all numbers, it's math. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's one kind of important place that that can go as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, we also brought up the question. This is something we've dabbled a little bit with online classes at CosmoQuest, um, but there's a big push in general towards online learning and also these these huge, the MOOCs, right? The, the multi, what is it? Massively online, open <laughs> online course. Massive, yes. massive <laughs> open online course. Am I, am I getting that right? MOOC, M-O-O-C, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> M double O C. Yes. So, uh, and and uh, we had that's a whole new field, and we're not sure what the best practices are for that either. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's something uh, I hear from people who've taken those classes. They like building. They have little coffee shop communities that get together and talk about the lectures. I mean, you still want a face to face component with that as well. So. Yeah. Well, you're right. It's those are new and exciting, and it's still. Um, sort of up for grabs as to how effective they are and how uh, how much learning goes on and um, how easy or difficult it is for people to access them because that's you know the big part the big uh, deal with them is that supposedly you know people who are far away from universities or can't afford to go to universities can still get a university quality course in whatever you know is available um, and there's still a lot of debate about that but mm -hmm you know they are really exciting and there's a lot of opportunity out there but as you mentioned the um, the big thing is still to make it interactive so even you know they think you know the most effective learning still happens even in those huge courses when people do get together and you know have a discussion however it happens on the MOOC you know in a discussion forum or a, a wiki or you know even you know some of them still have some face-to-face -face parts to them so they're not totally online so uh, that's still really important, but that's yeah. you know that's new and exciting. Um, but you know, no, not a lot of research, I'm sure, yet at all. On it. <laughs> yeah. So it's wide open, wide open spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, move on to the next topic, and this there was a a topic touched on by two speakers. So Mary Kay Hemingway, who's been uh, in the astronomy education field, uh, has has incredible experience in uh, teacher professional development and uh, Randy Ludwig as well. So they were doing a lot of hands-on, inquiry-based astronomy uh, teacher professional development, something we <laughs> know a little yeah, bit about. Yeah. We're also in the throes of planning. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and talking about the professional development going on for K-12 teachers. And she, uh, Mary Kay in particular provided an interesting statistic 
that 15% of high school teachers have had an astronomy class. I don't remember where this came from, but this is the rough number that they were quoting, is that only 15% of astronomy high school, te of high school teachers have ever had an astronomy class of some sort mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. I know I never had one in high school, um, but this is including their college education as well. Um, am I still showing up here? My screen just went blank. Oh, I see you. Okay, well, what? No, there. Okay. <laughs> we need tech. Um, uh, and, and in something in particular, I've looked at, uh, looking at the, the next-gen science standards, right? So the 26 or so states in the U.S. that have adopted these. Uh, there's quite a bit of astronomy um, being included as, as a content area. Uh, you have to know what the Big Bang is and be able to teach mm -hmm. that and how we know that, that, you know, that that's the prevailing model. Uh, so the, the question is, of course, how do we get, you know, in-service teachers to look at these, to, to learn these things mm -hmm. as well? Um, and I know you, you are actually in the middle of planning two <laughs> professional <laughs> development workshops right now. Yay. You can comment yes. on, on, on that. <laughs> well, it is interesting. Um, so some of the disciplinary, um, there, one of, let me start again. So there's three basic parts to the new standards, and one is um, the disciplinary core ideas. Mm -hmm. And there's four of them, and one of them is earth and space science. So, yeah, the, the earth, uh, not only earth science, but space science and astronomy is kind of um, highlighted there, which is, is really nice. But um, as you say, not everybody has had courses in that. Um, and even earth science, you know, um, that's something that often gets overlooked as well. So it's kind of interesting that those two are together. Um, uh, not always, you know, courses that teachers take. Um, sometimes, and but not always with the high it's, school. It's always been like biology, high chemistry, has their physics, own content areas that yeah. they they kind of like. You know, you get the biology folks, you get the chemistry folks, you know, maybe the physics people. Um, but you know, not so often uh, the earth science and the um, mm -hmm. and astronomy. So um, that is a nice emphasis with the new standards. Um, there's other things that are brand new, or at least, you know, um, haven't been highlighted before, like engineering and just the general idea of connecting everything. So um, that's something we're working on with um, the teachers that we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, is, is not only the new content areas that they might not be familiar with, but just this new idea that, you know, things have to be connected. Mm -hmm. um, things, you know, all the sciences don't work in isolation. You know, there's astrobiology, you know, there's all different kinds of engineering. Um, so it's very interconnected, and, and that's kind of a new idea. Because a lot of times, you know, people say, you know, I'm a biology teacher, I'm a, I'm a physics teacher, and that's what I do, that's what I studied. But now it's more important to really try to bring it all together. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of professional development just, you know, because of the standards, a lot that needs to be done. So, um, but yeah, astronomy is, of course, such an engaging subject that that's a nice place to start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's something we're working on. Um, you're, you're planning a, a two-week professional development uh, session in East St. Louis. It's happening the next two weeks. Um, yep. So. And see, so we've got a, a host of scientists um, doing that. And, and I know some of the things that they talked about in, in the talks are, are things that we're doing, you know, putting in these inquiry and engineering practices. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, inquiry is kind of, as I understand it, like an older version, fits more in the older standards, but it's just inquiry's the terminology. Inquiry has been, been around, used. oops, it, it's been around for a yeah. while as I knock things off my desk, sorry. <laughs> um, and there's different um, varieties, I think you could say, of inquiry. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to decide, um, you know, are you doing more guided inquiry? Are you doing mm -hmm. true inquiry? You know, how, how teacher or student centered is it? So there's different, there's like a whole spectrum of inquiry, but that in itself has been around for a while. Um, Engineering, of course, has been around, but not always something that teachers have, have done with their students in the classroom. So yeah. it's taken uh, on a new, you know, a new role here, um, a new level uh, with the new standards. So the idea of having um, an engineering design process um, is, is new for most teachers. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there's inquiry where you have students really taking the lead, um, ideally, in looking for questions to answer mm -hmm. and designing some sort of investigation to answer those questions. Um, but engineering is more of, you know, looking at a problem and thinking about um, ways to solve that problem. 
Um, so with uh, designing a product, um, perhaps, or something else, improving a product. And it's an iterative, um, iterative cycle uh, that you go through over and over again um, as you make improvements and modifications to, you know, optimize your solution to this problem. Um, it's very close and, and really overlaps a lot with the scientific method or science practices, um, but a little different focus. So that's um, something we'll be going over with the teachers and having them explore as they do activities in the next two weeks. Uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll learn a lot from doing that and from the evaluations and the, you know, things that we have them do. So I'm looking forward to that because I know they get to work on their own projects and that's something we get to help them with. Yep, I know. It's fun because it's, it's hands-on, it's um, interactive, you get to do projects. Um, it's really great. Yeah. So um, Sandlin Buxner, who we're actually working with on some of the evaluation stuff, um, also gave a talk uh, relating, talking more about NGSS and its effects on the professional development process. And the big thing is we have to retrain all the in-service teachers who <laughs> maybe aren't so comfortable with, with um, these concepts, as you were saying, or, or it's new to them. Um, you know, again, engineering is something that until this point has been overlooked in science education. So them being taught the way they were taught under older standards haven't had that. Um, and right, so right. That, that uh, others need to provide. Um, yeah, in a sense, the new standards, um, they're not all that different, I mean, in my opinion, um, from the old ones that were there, but they're, they're arranged a little differently. Um, mm -hmm. Things are highlighted and emphasized a little differently. So um, you have cross-cutting concepts now, which are, um, for example, looking for patterns, using models, things like that. And, you know, those, you could find those in the older standards, but they weren't as prominent. So mm -hmm. you had to maybe dig a little deeper to find them. And, and, um, and people just tend to focus more on content and teachers, I think, are more mm -hmm. comfortable with just, you know, I'm, I'm teaching this content in my class and yes. the processes and these patterns um, and other, you know, concepts are a little more difficult sometimes to get your, your uh, hands on. Yeah. Classroom. So, um, so there's a different emphasis, which, and I think that's really good, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a good emphasis for the new standards. Yeah, when I was teaching an astrobiology course, I was really comfortable coming up with activities for the astro part, not as much for the bio part. And I, I, you know, I told my students straight up, I don't, you know, last biology class I took was in high school, you know, so <laughs> you know, I took AP Bio and that was it. So that's where we're going from. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and it's hard, um, and, and teachers, I think, you know, part of what we have to do is, is you know, again, make sure that teachers are kind of comfortable going outside mm -hmm. their, you know, their own comfort zone. So here, you know, they've always taught physics, and, and now they have to bring in, you know, biology, hopefully, and earth science, and, you know, those are new things, and not that it can't be done, but it's another thing to do, and something that they haven't had to think about for a while. So, so just, you know, the idea of this is another new thing mm -hmm. um, for teachers to do, and, and they're already um, very burdened with many things that they have to do. Yeah. So, yeah. so just from that standpoint, it's, it's something that's a little difficult, but um, professional development, yep, is certainly going to be needed and certainly going to play a role um, in getting the standards into the classroom. So I have a slightly cheeky question, because a friend of mine <laughs> asked me this. Uh, my friend, my friend Gail Zazowski is an astronomer, and uh, I was, you know, talking about all these different standards and these standards and those standards and the new standards and and this stuff. And she says, "So why are they called standards <laughs> if there are so many?" And I had to stop and go, "Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Is it just that the process of standardizing something as complex as education is?" <laughs> Like it's difficult, yes, and there's many, um, many groups, uh, many organizations that, of yeah. course, you know, have their own take, um, and with good reason, you know, on, on what standards should be, so yeah. um, ideally there would be one set yeah. of standards for everybody. Standard. <laughs> um, yeah, standardize those standards, um, but, you know, that idea in itself rubs mm -hmm. some people the wrong way. So in our country, we have education um, being the, you know, sort of the realm of the states. Right, right. And, um, you know, not all the states want to do everything, you know, that the other states want to do um, and sort of, in a sense, give up that control. So actually there's, you know, there's some pushback sometimes um, from having standards being brought down 
on you, yeah, you know, top yeah. down, um, because the states have typically had control of education, and you know, of course, they don't, you know, they don't want to give that up. Mm -hmm. So they at least want to have a role in new standards that come along, which again, the new science standards um, kind of were formed that way, right, came from right. the states. So you know, eventually, I mean, if all the states adopt, then, you know, we will have this wonderful set of standards for everybody, but it's going to be up to the states to decide if they want to, you know, come on board or not. Um, and they haven't all said that they want to yet. Yeah. So I think, like you mentioned earlier, there's 26 that um, have not even adopted yet, but 26 states that were involved in, in the writing and development oh, okay. standards. Um, I actually think there's only two States so far that have adopted officially Rhode Island. Are, are we one of them? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not yet. <laughs> Rhode Island was the first. Um, Go Rhode Island. And I just saw, gosh, just like an hour you. ago somewhere, I want to say Kansas had okay. adopted. Hey. And I don't know if somebody in between those two did or not. So okay. we may have two. Maybe somebody knows. Sure can chime in. Well, now uh, that they're written, right, you have to adopt them, and then you have to build right, the curriculum, so that's and then you have to process. figure out how to evaluate it. Yeah, and then, right, the assessment will be a whole other big thing, and that's what right. everybody's, I think, kind of worried and waiting for, so. Yeah, well, and, and uh, the, what I hear from parents who are scientists but not teachers, um, they, they get really ruffled at the idea of standards because it is connected to the idea of multiple choice tests, <laughs> right? And, and that's yeah. the thing we all blame for having ruined science education, right, is multiple choice tests. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's, I think there's going to be, there needs to be buy-in from parents and from scientists who are parents and parents who are sciencey um, that these new standards are trying to not do that. No, they really are not meant for that. They're not even meant to be a curriculum. So when you look at the standards, you know, there's all these things that we hope all children will eventually learn. But it's not saying that this is actually what has to be taught or how it has to be taught in the classroom. So, but you know, I'm, people are going to think of it that way, I think, right. no matter what, because it's just, it's kind of easy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it shouldn't be you know, driving a multiple choice test, but yeah, that seems to be how it goes. So um, that's an issue that we have to get around somehow, someday, and I don't have the answer for that one, unfortunately. <laughs> what are you talking about? We have all the answers. <laughs> We're going to well, work it all I, You know, I have answers, but how to make, how yeah, to, how to yeah. make them actual reality Implement. is a whole other thing. Yes, actual implementation. Yeah. Um, and, and something that was talked about in general uh, at discussion afterwards, I've got one more talk to mention, but um, is that there hasn't been a lot of evaluation. There's been some evaluation of, of informal science learning environments, so like museums, um, mm -hmm. citizen science websites, <laughs> which is what we're starting on, and some of what I presented, but I will not share with you guys because we're not done collecting data, so you can't see it yet. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're still we're still collecting data on the survey, so you you can't see our data yet. It will skew your results. Mm -hmm. um, but um, and and so uh, people who are lifelong learners, or there's another new name I picked up, free choice learning. Right, mm -hmm. this is people learning outside of school. This is people deciding to do these things on their own, to read blogs, listen to podcasts. <laughs> yeah, right. you guys right here, <laughs> you're free choice learners. Yeah. Um, it is, and that's the key. One of the key um, things in informal science, so yeah. in informal education anywhere, is that you are free to choose. You're free to go. You're free to go do something else. Come back. It is free choice. Yeah, kids don't have a choice. <laughs> yes. Guys. So formal education, you're in the classroom. You don't have a whole lot of choice. Yeah. Yeah. But studying. Um, Not what, in the same way that what? you do. Yeah. Yeah. In a museum. But studying what brings people in, what people learn from it, because um, yeah. it's not an environment where you want to be tested. <laughs> right. Uh, that that's right. a whole other ball of wax. Like I I know some has been done, but I don't. It wasn't a main topic of discussion in that particular session, and I personally don't know much as much about it other than what we've started doing. Um, yeah. Well, that's the second key yeah. point of informal <laughs> environments and informal learning is that there's no assessment. Yeah. There's no, you know, no formal. So, you know, right. people may be wanting to study it and that's a whole other issue, but, you know, you're at the museum, you're looking at the displays, you know, there is no test. Right. There's no a comment you know, form, a feedback mm -hmm. form, something like that. 
a survey. Um, mm, it, it, that's is one right. Of, that's your opinion. That's evaluation on, you know, yes, did you like this? Right, did you like, right. But you don't have that feeling of, I need to engage with this, you know, display and it's wonderful, but, you know, oh, there's going to be a test later, yeah. so I better try to memorize or, I, you know, that I stress that's more interesting that stresses though. off. Yeah, but it's more interesting if they're not prepared. <laughs> I'm going to scare you guys. If they're not prepared for a test at the end, and be like, hey, what'd you learn? Um, it's more interesting to, to find out what people learn when they don't think a test is coming. Well, that's true. I, I don't know. know if that's if that's, if that's that's moral. <laughs> yeah, we might have some issues there. To get um, approval. But you're right, though. People do want to know what mm -hmm. people are learning from mm -hmm. these informal interactions, even though, yeah, there's not supposed to be a test. Right. So that is the real trick of you know, trying to be non-intrusive in mm -hmm, a way. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen them in the form of like what people are getting out of it. Yeah, yeah. I've seen them in the form of con of, of feedback forms. Yep. Um, so yeah, and those uh, are yeah. Sometimes they'll pick a very small sample and chat harmless. with them afterwards. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, there's something there's something there. Um, one last uh, major thing I wanted to mention from this session. Uh, Denise Smith came and talked about the NASA EPO forum. So NASA be, um, having its its education and public outreach uh, section. I'm going to add that link in there too, in the comments. Um, a lot of it is is uh, some of it's private, some of it is public. Uh, it's private in the way that uh, it's where we who are developing NASA education materials uh, mm -hmm. actually collaborate. Um, and you're going to see a lot coming out about evaluation of NASA EPO because. As you know, <laughs> the president's proposed budget uh, would slash a lot of that, and um, they've collected years of evaluation data saying our, our programs are doing good stuff, and so, mm -hmm. so they're, they're trying to highlight that a bit more, um, and it's, it's a really good program. These forums allow the scientists and the educators to get together and come up with the new materials and new ideas. Um, you've been working with the forums longer than I have. I've been in it for, for like a year now. Um, finally yeah, getting the hang of it. Not <laughs> much longer. They were kind of new to me also. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm still kind of exploring them. I, um, I went to the conference on the second day of this job. So <laughs> <laughs> that was really... We just throw mind. you right in there. Yeah. yeah, there's an astrophysics forum, yeah. there's a solar forum, there's a planetary forum. Planetary. I don't know See, if uh, heliophysics? Did you no. say? No. Oh, it's, so, it's solar. Yeah, helio. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That it's helio, sense. planetary, astrophysics. Those are the three I've had stuff from. And I yeah, think it one seems one. like there should be a fourth one. A fourth, and I don't remember because that's like mm -hmm. the one that I don't, I've never had produced material for. But, um, I <laughs> fail. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay. I'm failing mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, because we, we work with, we're primarily with, with planetary now, um, but this is the, the community of people. Yeah. Um, during the, the AAS, I know the president's budget had to be, um, uh, there was a live webcast where they were in front of Congress defending it. Um, mm. I only got to see part of it, but uh, there are some Congress critters that are very pro NASA, so... Yeah. That is is comforting, I think. Yeah, we won't, yeah, you know. That's a good a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So yay, NASA EPO. Mm. Um, let's see. What else did I? Believe? So were these? You said they were fifteen minute sessions. These Sorry. are fifteen minute talks, all in one session on Monday. Okay, afternoon. and then just a Q and A afterwards, or is it basically mm -hmm. presentation and? There yeah. was a yeah. There was a little bit of Q and A afterwards. They brought all everybody up, sort of as a panel. Um, like I said, mostly they talked about, uh, you know, a little bit of informal science education, uh, you know, what has that been do doing? Um, yeah. Any big concerns that seem to come out of the audience at all? or? The, I, I think or? there may have been, that's where I, I got in my head the discussion of a couple of parents, people who were scientists mm -hmm. but also parents, mm -hmm. um, concerned that, you know, the standards will kill <laughs> scientific curiosity. Uh, I vaguely remember that being a question that came up as well. Okay. Um, so like I said, NGSS, it, you, you got to have buy-in from the teachers and the parents. Um, so. Yeah, and it's more, I guess, you know, I it's the testing <laughs> that has to stop. Um, yeah. You know, standards are our guides, you know, it's, it's, this is what we think, you know, people should learn. This is what we think people should know by the time they reach this point in their education. But um, it doesn't mean that, yeah, we should have huge tests all the time that mm -hmm. may or may not be aligned with what's going on in the classroom. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, no, I, remember, I remember taking the regents exams. That's as a the thing. child of New York State, so I took the regents exams. <laughs> Anybody else who's a New Yorker here? Uh, it was it was it was a state test, and it was our final grade for the class. <laughs> yeah, so it was a double whammy, and it was all multiple. It was almost all multiple choice. Um, yeah, and you know, and that's another thing. You know, they call them high stakes testing for a reason. So I mean, even if we had those tests, but if they were not tied so heavily to teacher evaluation and even school evaluation, I mean, in a way, it makes sense that they might. But there's right. so many other factors involved in. Uh, the success of a school, um, the uh, success of a student, um, how good a teacher is, you know, there's just so much more than that. But right. having everything hang on those tests um, is just a lot of pressure. And it's completely understandable why those tests then become the focus of education for the year for this, you know, classroom. Because, you know, that's what teachers' jobs are hanging on. Um, you know, reputations of schools, principals, superintendents, districts, uh, it's amazing the pressure that they bring. So, you know, in a sense, it's not just the test, it's uh, what we're doing with the tests. I see, yeah, yeah. So, you're not just getting the information on how are things working. You're right, really it's, a, to... it's how you're using it. What are you using right. it for? <laughs> yeah. Not um, a happier note. Uh, <laughs> Yes. So I mentioned NASA forums before. I should also screen share the NASA Wavelength webpage. So this came out a few months ago, but it was brought up again. Um, this is nasawavelength.org. All of the NASA educational products are on one easy site. <laughs> <laughs> For a long time, I think they were tied to the mission pages, and so you had to find them on the individual mission pages. Now you can go over, you know, whatever. Okay, look, if you're teaching elementary school, there's like 800 lessons right. <laughs> to choose nice, from. Um, um, yeah, you can search for lessons, um, you know, topics. Uh, it's really nice, got a really nice search engine, lots yeah. of good things in there. So yeah. you can search, get your, so there's a whole bunch of chemistry and earth science. Um, and I know that they also have these strand maps, which I think ties into a lot of the standards as well. Um, so oh, if you want to, I hadn't to, looked at that know, before. Nice. They, they talked about this at NSTA. Okay. Um, when we were, we did a bunch of uh, workshops with teachers, and so they have these huge concept maps mm. um, that tie to particular. Uh, that doesn't have any. That has like 61. I don't remember how it. There you go. Here's are all the resources that fit that little bubble. Uh, wow, that's <laughs> um, amazing. And you can actually get into that individually. Okay. Uh, which is pretty cool. So, uh, whoops. So that is uh, an interesting, cool NASA product to share. NASA wavelength, good stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, there were some other, uh, there was a poster session as well. Um, right. So there were some interesting little posters. I don't have any, you know, I don't want to like share pictures of people's photos or anything, um, of posters or anything, but I did see some, uh, pick up some interesting things. One in particular, uh, I do have a picture of here for reference, so I know who did it. Um, this is from Furman University. Uh, they did a first year seminar class of science and science fiction. So oh, of course, good. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> I saw it in passing, I didn't get a chance to look closely, so my friend sent me a picture of it. <laughs> but like, they read different um, science fiction books, I think specifically pertaining to Mars in this one. I don't, I can't remember, but, um, and then talked about the science behind them. And so they read like the Red Mars series and talked about yeah. you know, colonization and, uh, and, um, and this is for um, undergraduate? Mm -hmm. Undergraduate freshmen. Like freshmen, okay. Yeah, yeah, probably. Actually, yeah, first year seminar. So I know a lot of schools have a first year um, seminar course. It's a little okay. bit beyond, you know, it's a little unusual. I did one on utopian literature when I was in college. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, you know, good. It gives you the chance to look at those unusual yeah. topics. Yeah, oh, and so they did. And oh, oh, I was a TA for one that was literally all about rockets and dinosaurs. Like <laughs> we did dinosaurs, and then we did rockets. <laughs> like there was no overarching theme except for like things kids like. Okay. <laughs> about that science. Works. It was the coolest thing. I was a TA for that. But anyway, so this is this this would be just as cool. Um, it was science and science fiction. Um, you can have them read a book for that. You can pick out your you know particular episodes of Star Trek or or Babylon Five or Stargate. 
Uh, I can think of a Stargate episode I would show for Black Hole Physics <laughs> right off the top of my head. <laughs> were they doing movies and TV as I, well? Or I don't it... know how much they did oh, movies and TV. I know they definitely did books. It was a liter I think it was a literature professor and a, an astronomer. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can add those clips in, and you great. can add those in as, as extras if you don't want them. If yeah. You can't have them reading all, you know, on every subject you touch. You can yeah. have some viewers, some, some, um, I have to remember this. I think I'm going to be involved in the sci-fi club here at SAUE next semester, so yeah. <laughs> I need to remember this. That's a great, I mean, that's a great idea to, to do, and you can do that at, um, many levels, many yeah. levels of yeah. so. And you, know, you you team up with an English professor, and you, mm -hmm. you're just good to go. <laughs> so I love that idea. <coughs> um, there was another one I don't have, I don't remember the link of, but there is a gentleman who's starting. Uh, he went looking around for open source astronomy textbooks and didn't find one he liked, and mm. so he is starting one. Uh, and it's 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 sort of like it's sort of being built as a wiki, but not in that it'll be frozen every semester so that the textbook doesn't change mid-semester on people um, mm -hmm. but it'll be an open source astronomy textbook he's in, he's been inviting people to be writers and editors um, I, I have the card somewhere I'll have to add that into the show notes later okay. um, looking for, for people to write or edit on their particular uh, area of expertise um, and so I think I signed on to help out with the astrobiology chapter oh excellent I, I taught that class before so hopefully that, that, that will be a, uh, a good resource because I know, again, we do our online classes through CosmoQuest, and so we don't want to <laughs> ask people to buy a book for a four-week mm -hmm. online class. You know, it's expensive. Blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but you can have people use that as a reference, and it will be sourced from people all over the field. Yep. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, oh, gosh, what else did I run into that I can't think of? Uh, oh, there was a couple more teacher professional development type things. Um, one of them is the NASA. You know, I'll just put the link in there. It's called NITARP. Um, but these are the, these uh, more professional development opportunities that teachers could could on if they want to get more space science in the classroom. Um, and in particular, they were evaluating some of the um, some of the results they had from their professional development. Um, there was another. Uh, there was a, a researcher I talked to who um, had a certain way of teaching girls in elementary school using spatial, uh, that improved their spatial reasoning skills. Um, so there was uh, a oh. difference. Um, she had teachers trying different ways of teaching. I can't remember the specifics again. I have a picture somewhere um, of, of not just splitting girls and boys, but also they were doing uh, demographics by race as well. And so the ones that there was a certain way of teaching spatial concepts using these two-dimensional and three-dimensional models that were um, really helpful for girls, and especially girls, uh, minority girls. And so that was really cool. So seeing this in the classroom research um, was pretty mm -hmm. exciting as well. Um, yeah, that's the really cool thing about, I don't know, especially I like the poster sessions just because you... You just see such a variety of, of different projects. Yeah. You can take a look and, and see, you know, their results, and it's not, you can take as much time as you want, and usually you can talk to the people. Right. Um, and you just get a nice variety of, you know, things that people are trying sometimes in the classroom like this and yeah. um, come away with some really good ideas. Now I have the list open, and I'm going to find <laughs> it. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Uh, oh, one, okay. Jeff the, Jeffrey Burks was the younger one. Younger kids too. This was with What's the that? girls. No, uh, the the one that was the open source introduction to astronomy textbook was Jeffrey Burks. Mm, okay. Uh, from I don't know if it has uh from Tennessee State, and you know I'll just link to all these abstracts. Um, there's the freshman year seminar. Uh, <laughs> there's my poster. <laughs> Uh, oh, I found it. Marin Cole. I think that's who it was. Uh, University of Kentucky. Um, this was actually specifically a, uh, they were observing the moon and doing spatial science reasoning, uh, of course. Oh, and Jennifer Willem. Sorry, that's the other one that was spatial reasoning um, using different, uh, so Jennifer Willem of University of Kentucky as well, um, doing uh, different types of spatial reasoning uh, activities with girls. Uh, so I will link to these, to, to the abstracts. I'm pretty sure these are all available without 
signing in, but that may not be true. Um, but I will I will find them. They 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 at least have to be on ADS. <laughs> I will find them. I will find them. Uh, so a lot of a lot of interesting yeah. stuff being done in the classroom, in mm -hmm. the college level, uh, at elementary school level, and so that's always always pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. And I know we're in for more at Astronomical Society of the Pacific in July. It's in, in Jose. July. Yeah. So we're between the two of us. We're giving like four presentations. <laughs> yeah, could be, could be. Yeah, that's a great one for. That's a much more education focused mm -hmm. than AES. Although mm -hmm. um, I think AES is, you know, their education portion is is growing mm -hmm. or has been growing at least. Yeah, um, yeah. But ASP is is definitely focused on on education and public outreach right. um, at all levels. So that's an exciting one. It's a fun one to go to. Yep. Yeah, so, I'm excited because yeah. I went last year and I was new to this, so I didn't really have anything to present. I was just kind of watching. Uh, so this time, having having a couple posters and, and, and presentations to do will be good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in San Jose. Um, so yeah, you know what I'll do is I'll yeah. I'll write a blog post on these interesting abstracts that I have found and talk to the people for. Cause there's a couple of others. Uh, I don't want to get too wordy with them without having something cool to show. So I will <laughs> I will do that. Uh, my list of blog posts to write. Um, there were some other interesting things going on at AAS. Um, starting at the last January one, uh, they're working on, since they have, you know, a few hundred to a few thousand astronomers in one place, <laughs> why not bring in school kids, right, and, and unleash them? Uh, actually, it's, it's way more uh, organized than that. Um, <laughs> they, they've done an amazing job. So basically, one day... Uh, that during lunchtime, when there's very few astronomers wandering the exhibit hall, they'll bring in a group of school children, several hundred school children. <laughs> and you see the confused looks of the astronomers going, why are all these little yeah. kids here? Um, <laughs> they, did, they did middle school and high school students uh, in January, uh, so I participated in that one and did Making Craters, and I showed them CosmoQuest on the big NASA wall. Um, mm. This time I wasn't uh, directly involved, although I did help stuff their goodie bags full of, of swag mm. from us and from from other organizations that <laughs> brought their stuff last minute. That's important. That's yes. very important. Give them the swag, but uh, my friend. Free stuff. Yeah, yeah. My friend uh, Gail Zazowski gave a talk. Um, this was mostly middle schoolers this time, so a younger group. Um, they asked the most amazing question. <laughs> Gail was just like, Wow, that was a good question to every single question. They were asking, because um, she was talking about the Milky Way, and, and, and uh, yeah. she studies particularly, she maps out the distribution of dust in the Milky Way, and so they were asking really detailed, insightful questions about <laughs> galaxy structure and morphology and evolution, uh, which was really exciting to see. Um, so uh, they had that, and then they broke yeah. off into groups and went around to different stations. Uh, I have a picture of a group at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory station, of course, um, <laughs> because I love those guys. Because, you know, say hi. <laughs> They're grad student for many years. Uh, so you've got all these kids sitting on the floor uh, and he's got he's answering questions and they have a video so showing a radio image of Cassiopeia A oh, uh, nice. and you know like I said they, they got freebies from all the organizations as well, <laughs> posters. Like, they may have actually given them the poster that's behind me, the Cygnus A. Um, Yes, one of them is using event. the poster as a telescope. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they, have got, yes. they may, I think they got that, that poster back there. It's Hercules A in that Ooh, radio. One lovely. of my favorites. Um, so, yeah, so they went around. Um, there was a couple of the optics people had little things to show them. Um, some had movies. Some had demos. I know Chandra does this... Um, Universe in a bottle thing with jelly beans and yes, with the the jelly beans. Yeah. I've seen that. That's the color of the jelly bean uh, corresponds to um, like what it is. If it's like dark matter, dark energy, or, or regular matter, right, baryonic matter. And so you've got all these black jelly beans, <laughs> which are the licorice ones, which are my mother's favorite. So <laughs> I feel like I need to give her this. Um, oh. Last year they had a pulsar, which is like a little red LED, like in a ball of clay on a string and you spin it and you get oh. <laughs> and so it looks like a pulsar. I think um, I've seen that. Yeah, I want to make one. <laughs> so they have yes. some really good activities. for. I don't know how the schools actually sign up to be a part of it, um, but I can find out when the January one gets closer. The January yeah. one is going to be in the D.C. area. It's going to be in a resort type area thing in Maryland. So not, okay. not downtown like it usually is. It's okay. a little further out. Um, and that's just an hour, did you say, that they opened? That was a few, the... 
I want to say it was an hour. No, it was more than an hour. I think okay. it was more like two hours. Okay. And they have, I forget, maybe 10, 15 minutes at each each station. They ring a bell and they all like switch. It's very well. I mean, to have several hundred kids in that conference center, it was very well coordinated. That's they great. They have a system and it's, they have a system. So it's not mass chaos. It's not mass chaos. It's okay. That many kids. And I'm funny, my Could friend <laughs> Gail was like nervous going up there. She's like, uh, I'm really nervous. I'm like, Gail, we've worked with elementary school kids we, all through grad school. She's like, yeah, but we had like no more than 10 or 15 at a time. There's 200 in front of me. <laughs> yeah, they'll behave. It's fine. So they had um, teachers and parents, I'm assuming. Along yeah, they, they, yeah, they brought uh, the, each group had a chaperone that was either a teacher or a parent as well. So they, get, they got freebies too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, good, good thing. They get the freebies. They get the demos. Um, they did edible astronomy uh, with one group, which I am doing, stealing some of those activities. <laughs> Yeah. Some of those activities I've already done anyway. Yeah. Um, so what were they eating? They made ah, I love this. They made an uh, active galactic nucleus, right, out of a bagel. A bagel. <laughs> so the okay. bagel is the Taurus, right? <laughs> and and the ice these ice cream cones that stick out the other each end, which are the jets, or, or, or <laughs> then there's Twizzlers involved. I don't know. <laughs> it's not the kind of stuff you'd all want to eat together, but it makes a pretty convincing. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> It's not that bad. I don't, Twizzlers, bad. bagel, and ice cream cone? I don't, I don't know how I feel oh, about that. Oh, hey, to try it. Yeah. I, I will try any food once. So. As long <laughs> as this doesn't have a high delicious. probability of killing me, I will try any <laughs> food once. Say that on, on record. Um, and mm. something else they did, uh, I heard about this from, from Rick Feinberg. Um, so I packed up my telescope and put it in my car for the star party. So they actually did a star party from downtown Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. I was a little worried how this was going to work out, but since there was no moon and Saturn was up at the... So this is... Um, they were just setting up... Um, they had a whole bunch of uh, people from, from the Amateur Society in Indianapolis. Um, Great. And so this particular telescope is completely handmade. This, this nice looking guy scope. there. Yes. And there's some huge and oh my god! So I met this guy, uh, Mike. I can't remember his last name. So hi, <laughs> um, but I know his Twitter handle because he recognized my Twitter handle. Um, and by the end of the night, most people had had got, had come by, had left, and so we were goofing around and looking at as many. Um, you know, messy objects as we could from mm -hmm. downtown Indianapolis. It was like, it's a fuzzy smudge. It's another fuzzy smudge. Um, but really, Saturn Saturn was the main attraction. Um, and so we had all these telescopes with different views of Saturn. You can see many of its moons through some of the bigger ones. I had my little ETX-90 out there, which um, my, uh, Tim, my boyfriend, uh, was able to run for me while I ran around handing out handouts. <laughs> um, uh, there were, you know, lots of people coming from the restaurants, um, there were there were kids who were graduating high school. Uh, their graduation was actually in the convention center, so hey. they got pulled aside to look through the telescopes and look at Saturn. So I think I, I don't know what the numbers are. We, they reached uh, quite a few people um, with Saturn, and uh, yeah, Saturn never disappoints. Yeah, yeah, it, it was it was amazing. Great. And then and then we got a really spectacular ISS pass as well. Oh, bonus! <laughs> All right. Yeah, it was like, a, it was great. So uh, somebody had been tracking on one of their apps on their phone. Um, yeah. I guess I should plug, I use ISS Tracker on my Android um, phone, but there's there, there are lots and lots of these. Heavensabove.com, of course, is like a great website for this. I know, I was going to say, that's where I go. Um. Yeah. I don't know if they have an <laughs> app, though, or if that's you know, the app that feeds all the others. <laughs> I have no idea. I yeah. don't know. Um, and so, yeah, so, uh, you know, we all ran to the back of that field there because it would be behind a building. So we had to run to the back of the field so we could see it above the building. And we're like, whoa, cool. And then mm -hmm. someone goes, I'm going to get my telescope. Runs back to the telescope. <laughs> and a couple of people got to see it flash through. But you really, um, if, you, if you're trying to track it, binoculars work better than a telescope. Um, I would think some so. People say it does look like like a, like a little TIE fighter. Um <laughs> Oh really? Oh, yeah, God. yeah. You can actually resolve details if, if you're tracking it well with binoculars, um, and so yeah. So that was pretty cool. And like I said, it you know people were you know coming by, stopping by, seeing Saturn, and then actually talking with the um, with the the local astronomers there, just with all their equipment and all the stuff that they were seeing. Um, yeah. Yay, astronomy clubs. Yay, yay and, and there was a, they're so good with that. Yes. Yep. 
And there was actually a few special sessions um, specifically geared towards amateur astronomers, uh, and they had a uh, they were able to purchase a day pass or a two day pass to go to those talks and oh. to the rest of the meeting as well. So for the first time, AAS was open to people who are non members. And uh, not needing us because usually you can only go as a non-member if you're sponsored by a member. So that's you know okay. for student, you know my first time when I went as a student, I was sponsored by my advisor. Yeah. Um, so it was actually open to non-members. And, and they could go to the rest of the meeting. And as they could well. go to the rest of the meeting too. Is that I mean, the first time they've done that. I think that was the first time they've done that. Yeah, I think I, I saw a press release about that being the first time. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the talks were were geared to that audience specifically because the rest of them, you know, you walk in if you're not. Actively working in that field, those five-minute talks are going to blow right by you. But the, yep, plen the was... hour-long plenary <laughs> sessions are really interesting and and yeah. and geared towards you know people with a general knowledge. And um, of course, you can walk around the poster room and talk to the posters and, and the exhibitors and all, all that fun stuff. Yeah, no, that's it's a lot of it's overwhelming, um, and <laughs> it was totally over my head, like you say, because um, there's a lot of just. Yeah amazing stuff there um, but yeah the, the education stuff and, and the posters are great and yeah. so and I know there was probably some workshops before uh, the meeting yes uh, um, Center for Astronomy Education did a workshop but I was gonna say right but I yeah that's I the only one I, I actually uh, saw yeah. it was it was light on workshops um, in January they'll be doing a bunch more they usually do I know last year they did early career to early career development workshops um, for postdocs and like me. Yep. Um, there's an astronomy ambassadors program that they're doing that are it's trying to get early career scientists, so undergrads, grad students, postdocs, young professors, to become more comfortable with outreach. Mm -hmm. um, and so I might apply for that. Uh, I, I, point, I said, am I gonna, you know, is it for people who are new to outreach? Are they gonna say, we can't accept you because you know some of this already? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So, but uh, there, I think there's there's still a lot to learn and a lot to do and it's a, it's a, they're building a community of people who can talk about science, who are scientists. Yeah, I would think so, right. Yeah. So I'll apply. We'll, we'll yeah, <laughs> communication about science is yeah. also really important, yeah. Yeah, so, so the Astronomy Ambassadors Workshop is usually before mm -hmm. the meeting as well. Um, they, they do data workshops now, they do uh, um, how to handle big data sets, and of course now since um, last January uh, there was a hack day. If you're at AAS mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's the uh, the hacker mentality of get together mm -hmm. for a day and just do a project. <laughs> just do yep. just sit down and do a project. Now I did the, the video uh, I usually do some kind of video project because I'm not I'm not so good with the fast coding. <laughs> that'll that'll be coming up in January as well. So yeah, AAS 223. It'll be in the DC area in January. Um, that's that's the big meeting. So yeah, be a lot more going on. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So yeah, and so you have uh, probably some abstracts planned. I'm assuming for that, or you're not that thinking that far ahead yet. <laughs> We just put in the dead last ASP one. <laughs> I know. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. I think. I think. I think. I Dragon Con needs to is the next major. Yeah, that. Place. Yeah, that'll happen first. Yeah. Um, Michael Jobin commented. Uh, I hope you make a pulsar with an adjustable pole orientation. Um, and because it's made of clay, I assume it's not that hard to do, right? Because if the if you if it's on a string, right? Or yeah, if it's on a string. So the, the magnetic pole is the LED pole, right? And the rotational pole is the string it's on. You can pull string. the string out and pull yeah. it through another way um, and, and move it around as well. So uh, sounds like it. something we have to try and sounds like something maybe you could show a little demo of. Yes. For a episode. I don't yeah. know. No, for a future episode, we will make yeah. a pulsar. <laughs> we'll make a pulsar. Worth a try. Why not? Yes. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, so that's all I had for my AAS update. AAS uh, update. I will follow up with a blog post on cosmoquest.org slash blog uh, that will um, link to some of these abstracts that I talked about. Uh, they should be in ADS, so I'll pull them. I'll pull at least the abstracts out, um, and that you, that way you can you can get more information um, for some of these yeah. projects because yeah. uh, it's it's a lot of good stuff, and I'm happy to share <laughs> beyond yes. the meeting. Yes, all about um, sharing. Yeah, Very scary, good. scary. Mm -hmm. um, so next week, uh, we are going to be busy with our teach professional development. We have six teachers coming in uh, to the Edwardsville area to learn Terra Luna uh, and actually get a really in-depth, hands-on experience using 
um, the Terra Luna curriculum in the, in the classroom. So this is the middle school earth science geolo lunar geology unit that uh, geology, right. you guys have created. So that's uh, we'll Kathy be doing a lot of fun you. yeah activities and looking at moon mappers as well. So yes, um, yes, we'll be doing moon mappers. So online citizen science in there too. Yeah, so we will probably not have a regular episode, but I will do a short update uh, from the workshop because I'm uh, as we did with NSTA. There's some fun video and pictures you can get out of having teachers make craters. So as long as as long as they're willing to uh, sign a waiver, I will be sharing those. <laughs> if they don't, I still have video from NSTA. Those those teachers Just were out. yes, we could we could dig that out. They they, they were they were really fun. Yeah. <laughs> there was flour everywhere. Um, uh, yes. So that's next week, that and then good. two weeks from now, I think we're uh, yeah we're gonna have the Mad Art Lab people. We're gonna have a full hangout, uh, full of of science geeky artists who blog at Mad Art Lab. Uh, and if you have not checked out their blog, and you it, you should because they just do amazing stuff. They create amazing stuff. Uh, they're geeky and fun and sciency. And so we'll be having them on the show in two weeks. Um, uh, otherwise, we've got Weekly Space Hangout on Friday. Mm -hmm. Saturday and Sunday will be the Hangout-a-thon. <laughs> yeah. Pamela and I will be hosting that. Uh, and uh, there will be a virtual star party on Sunday after that as well. And then Astronomy Cast on Monday, assuming Pamela's still alive. Still right. After... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wake with me all weekend. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, so hangouts for everybody. Hangouts for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys for, for watching and joining uh, and and, uh, and commenting and sharing. Uh, we really do appreciate that. So uh, thanks a lot, and yeah. we'll see you next week if we don't already see you this weekend. Yeah, okay. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.